What on earth is this? Genuinely, I can't really see it. Have you ever taken a stroll through an urban area in the northernmost reaches of Germany, reached the banks of a major river and thought, damn, the only thing cooler than being able to cross this river right now would be to, for some inexplicable reason, have a choice of four different ways of doing so? No? Oh, uh, oh, well I thought as a viewer of my channel you'd be a bit more interested in, you know, intermodal forms of transport. No, 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 it's fine. D seriously, don't worry about it. It's just a bit disappointing to hear you say that. It's going to make the next 10 minutes of this video a bit awkward. This is Rendsburg, or Rendsburg, in the mysterious state of Schleswig-Holstein, up here near Denmark. It's sort of the wild seafaring corner of Germany, known for its unique Schleswigish dialect and a local dish called Birnen, Bohnen und Speck, or pears, beans and bacon. I wonder what it consists of. Rendsburg is the capital of the rendsburg eckenförde district. It would be weird if it wasn't, wouldn't it? And thus is something of a commercial centre for the region. After all, it's one of the major settlements on the Kiel Canal, a genuinely remarkable piece of engineering built between 1880 and 1895, and running 98 kilometers from Kiel to Brunsbrüttel. It's a hugely important shipping canal connecting the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, and Rendsburg, which had been around for about 900 years prior to its construction, grew dramatically in size and population once the canal came to town. Unfortunately, trains are a bit older than the canal, and the construction of the waterway severed the Neumünster and Flensburg train line, a major rail route used for passengers and cargo. For about a decade following the opening of the canal, the train line connected to a pair of swing bridges, which poked out of the water and pivoted to either be parallel or perpendicular to the water. Now, this was all well and good for the trains, but these swing bridges were only 7 meters or 23 feet off the surface of the water, and thus most ships couldn't pass under them. And with the constant stream of shipping on the Kiel Canal, backlogs of boats would find themselves waiting for about half an hour for the bridges to pivot into train-friendly mode, the train to cross, and then the bridges to pivot back to being open again. And they simply couldn't be waiting around that long. Their pears, beans and bacon would all get cold. Furthermore, in the early 1900s, the canal was widened, making the use of swing bridges pretty impractical. They'd need a third one, which just seemed excessive. And so engineer Frederick Voss was commissioned to find an answer, and he concocted a rather dramatic solution to the problem. This is the Rendsburg High Bridge, one of the largest steel constructions in all of Europe constructed between 1911 and 1913. It's a classic early 20th century cantilever bridge spanning the canal. It's ludicrous size, solving the old boat problem and then some. It increased the elevation of the train line from 7 metres on the old swing bridges to 42 metres or 138 feet, with the total height of this thing being 68 metres or 223 feet, comfortably allowing even the largest container ships to pass through. For the time, this bridge was extraordinarily expensive. I'm not going to attempt to calculate the price in today's money considering Germany's multiple changes in currency since 1913, but with such a big price tag came a pretty cool claim to fame. This immediately became the longest railway bridge in Germany. The bridge itself, the steel truss crossing the Kiel Canal, is 2,486 metres long in total, including the approach viaduct, and the main suspended span over the canal is 140 metres long. But you know I wouldn't fly all the way to Hamburg and then drive two hours up the autobahn just to see any old railway bridge. Well, I mean, I might, but uh, there are two things about this bridge that make it pretty impressive. One of which makes it unique in the entire world. The first stems from how close the bridge is to Rendsburg Station on the other side of the canal. From the station to the canal is only about 300 meters, and obviously it's impossible for trains to climb from ground level to that height in 300 meters. That's without it being a cog railway or... Oh. Okay, um, without it being a cog railway or some other pulley system. But instead of moving the station back, as they didn't want to move it too far away from the canal, Frederick Voss came up with the idea of using an enormous elevated railway loop for the trains to spiral up to bridge height. Spiral loops are not unheard of on train lines. There are dozens all over the globe. But Rendsburg is, as far as I can tell, the only one in the world that is integrated into a fully urban area, making it a rather striking sight from both ground level and the sky. The loop also transforms the Rendsburg High Bridge from being an impressive structure into a pretty mind-blowing one. The total length of the elevated track from the start of the loop to the line rejoining the ground south of the canal is over seven and a half kilometers or just under five miles long. I found a Reddit thread claiming it was the largest and heaviest steel structure in the world upon completion, a title it held until the Golden Gate Bridge was opened, but I wasn't able to verify that so just pretend you didn't hear this sentence. It was also surprisingly deadly. Seven workers were reportedly killed during its construction out of a workforce of 350. That's a fatality rate of 
percent, which would never happen today. That would be like if over a thousand people died constructing the stadiums for the Qatar World Cup. The second thing that makes the Rendsburg High Bridge cool, and the one that makes it unique in the world, is that underneath the train line, hanging down, is what the Germans call a Schweberfahrer, or a floating ferry, which connects to a road either side of the canal in order to let pedestrians and cars across. That means as well as being a rail bridge, this structure also serves as what's called a transporter bridge. Don't you love it when you travel all the way across Europe just to come and see something and on that day a severe fog warning is issued? The visibility seems to be getting slightly better, so here's hoping. Transporter bridges are already pretty rare. There are only around 13 of them in the world, and only eight of those are currently in use, this being one of them. But this is the only one that is a hybrid rail and transporter bridge, so that's why it's extra ultra super duper special. Four cars and up to 100 pedestrians can be transported on every journey. Uh, which takes around 90 seconds each way. And it's completely free to use, which is nice. And uh, people do use it, despite there being you know, pedestrian and uh, road tunnels elsewhere in the city. About 500 cars and 2,000 pedestrians use this uh, ferry every day. And look, there's also a little cabin to wait in if the uh, ferry is on the other side. Or I suppose if you are waiting for the fog to clear. His echo is so bad. Um, it's very big, the bridge, obviously. But uh, it's not until you're here, and maybe it's not until it's shrouded in fog, that you realize quite how large it is. It's got sort of megalophobia vibes going on. It's also, I guess it's because of its age and the fact that it's all steel. When a train goes over it, you can't really fault it because it's old, but when a train goes over it, it's very, very loud. Like the whole city can hear it. Um, and the barriers are coming down, so I guess I better go get on this ferry. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't actually realize that that was the ferry. I thought that was just part of the jetty and that the ferry was on the other side. So <laughs> I guess we're gonna have to wait for the next one. Here we go. God, I wish I hadn't had to wait out here for 20 minutes for the next journey. <laughs> Oh, okay, here we go. Probably doesn't even look like it's moving from the camera. But it is. It's, um, yeah, smooth ride. It's a little bit wobbly. But yeah. <laughs> it's followed the exact same schedule since its original opening on the 2nd of December 1913 running every 15 minutes from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. or 10 p.m. in winter. However, where once the bridge had priority over boats, now the boats have enacted revenge and the transporter has to wait if a ship is coming down the canal. So the ferry in its current form is uh, about four meters, five meters wide and, and 10 meters long. It weighs about 40 tons. It's suspended from 12 ropes or, I mean, metal cables, which are clamped to a vehicle that runs along the underside of the bridge at the top. That vehicle has about eight wheels and uh, runs on an electric motor. And I say current form because the original ferry, which trundled along peacefully for 103 years with a slight bump from a boat in 1993, was damaged beyond repair following a collision in December 2016. In the early hours of the morning, there appeared to be some sort of confusion as to who had the right of way, and a ship slammed into the ferry head on, injuring a number of people and forcing the Federal Water and Navigation Administration to decommission the transporter, replacing it with a new, slightly lighter model. However, the commissioning of the new ferry took four years, and in the meantime, uh, cars had to use the canal tunnel, while pedestrians got to use the Rendsburg Pedestrian Tunnel. Uh, which was completed in 1965 and at the time, I believe, had the longest escalators in what would later become the EU. And if that's not a claim to fame, I don't know what is. It's 55 meters long, but it's now second to one in a metro station in Prague, which is 87 meters long. And either way, there are ones in the former Soviet Union that are like well over 100 meters long, so it's a bit of a pointless statistic, really. Right, I'm in the tunnel now. I mean, you might also see online some really crazy uh, claims that it's the longest pedestrian tunnel in the world. But, like, there are longer ones in London. This one's only about 240 meters long, with both escalators included. The longest pedestrian tunnel in the world is in Norway, and it's about three kilometers long. So, whoever wrote this, uh, I would love to have whatever you are smoking. It's also uh, not heated in the slightest. 
uh, and it's creating a bit of a sort of wind tunnel effect. And it's absolutely freezing down here, so I'm going to go back upstairs. And as a fun little side note, when you're done with the tunnel, you can come up here and sit on the banks of the Kiel Canal on what is apparently... Ooh. And as a side note, when you're done with the pedestrian tunnel, you can come up to the banks of the canal and sit here for a view of the bridge on what is apparently the world's longest bench. What the hell is going on in this town? Ah, what a great view. So if you're ever in Rendsburg, then stop by the bridge to check it out. Although, to be honest, it's so big that if you're ever in Rendsburg, it'd be quite hard not to check it out. It just sort of introduces itself to you whether you want it to or not. Also, if you're ever on a train going through Rendsburg to the south, be sure to look outside the window to experience the cool spiral. I'm annoyed I didn't have time to do that myself. Oh well. Right, well that's the end of this video. Um, <laughs> a fun thing that happened is I, I brought my drone to film this one, but because of the insane fog, um, I thought, oh, I'm not actually gonna film it and I'll find some stock footage online, which I did in the end. But then as the fog started to get a little bit lighter and a little bit, you know, less uh, intense, I thought, you know what, I'll just send the drone up. And first off, the shots look like something out of a horror movie. It's definitely not the vibe I was going for, and they're pretty unusable, although you are seeing them now, so I suppose <laughs> they're not that unusable. But the other thing is that suddenly my drone started like flipping out and uh, and spinning and tumbling, and it, I got an error message saying, like, land immediately, motor error, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, dear, this is all going to end in tears. So I got it down, and... Uh, just as it was about to reach the floor, it suddenly turned off and like hit the floor quite hard. And I was like, oh dear, is it damaged? And I looked closer and in the fog, the propellers had iced up. Look, real ice. It taught me a lesson about icing and aerodynamics. <sighs> but yeah, that's my little side story. Uh, see you later.